Howdy, folks. Live from Big Top Chautauqua, welcome to another episode of Tent Show Radio. I can't believe another year's gone around us at a big top. I see there high above the ground. Belly who? Oh, belly who? Funding support for Tent Show Radio is provided by the Bayfield Inn. Stay, dine, and relax year-round on the shoreline of Lake Superior in downtown Bayfield. Any traveler, any season, any meal, your view awaits. More info at bayfieldin.com. And by the Ashland Area Chamber of Commerce, the historic mural capital of Wisconsin. For a free brochure of self-guided mural tours, find us at visitashland.com. Ten Show Radio is also funded by a grant from the Green Bay Packers Foundation. And here's your host of Ten Show Radio, best-selling author, humorist, and singer-songwriter, Michael Perry. Howdy, folks, and welcome to Tent Show Radio from Lake Superior Big Top, Chautauqua. We have a tradition up at the Big Top. Rather than opening night, we have New First Night. And tonight we go back to New First Night, and not just any New First Night. This one was historically special. You'll hear me speak from the heart. You'll hear joyful music from the Blue Canvas Orchestra and singers. And at intermission, I'll share a story about our hunger to gather together it in a big old tent around a little old fire. And then later on, I'll tell that guinea pig story. Folks, the music you're about to hear emanates from a special space in a special place. The Big Top is just that, a grand blue and pearl gray striped canvas beauty suitable for a circus, but in this case, home to a history of live performance centered on the stage. The big top seats are set directly on the earth, and what a spot of earth it is. High atop a hill overlooking beautiful Bayfield, Wisconsin, Lake Superior, and those all-natural water-bound wonders, the Apostle Islands. If you enjoy that vision, if you enjoy what you hear over the course of the next hour and want to see and experience it firsthand, please get to know us at www.bigtop.org. It sounds beautiful up here because it is beautiful up here. You ought to come on up. Folks, the show tonight harkens back to a night in June. A night in June when the canvas flaps of the Lake Superior Big Top Chautauqua were raised to admit an audience for the first time in over a year. It wasn't a full house because we were still navigating a new reality and had to limit the seats, but it sounded like a full house felt like a full house. The music was provided by our very own Blue Canvas Orchestra and Singers. They're the very heart and soul of this tent. And at one point, I got up and told a story about a guinea pig. But we began the evening with the blessing of the tent. It is only proper that the first music you hear tonight is breathed from the flute of Michael Charette, a member of the Red Cliff Band of the Lake Superior Ojibwa, performing through his spirit name, Laughing Fox. Let's go back to the tent.
Okay, how many people listen to Tent Show Radio? Do we have anybody? Well, it just so happens that we have the host of Tent Show Radio with us right here, Mr. Michael Perry. Yeah. How are you doing? It's really great to gather under canvas. Happy to be here. Uh, tonight's going to be a night for seeing humans again face to face. That's great. It's going to be a night of music and song. Um, and I hope some laughter because I'm going to tell a couple of stories later that are intended to be funny. <laughs> but I guess you'll be the judge of that. But before we get there, I want to, from my heart, uh, frame the evening by letting you know that a certain percentage of the audience tonight is here because they were people who, over the course of the last year, served all of us on the front lines, be it in healthcare, be it as first responders, be it as people who showed up every day to keep things going while the rest of us did whatever it was we were doing. And in order to honor them, before we get started here, I wanted to read an excerpt. I was uh, given the opportunity some years ago to write a book about being on the volunteer fire department and rescue service in a small town. And when I wrote that book, I knew that there would be two audiences reading that book. Maybe just two people, but... <laughs> I knew that one person would be someone who had served as a firefighter or an EMT or a paramedic. And for them, I would have to write very specifically and accurately because the minute I hit a false note, they'd recognize it. On the other hand, I knew that there would be people reading that book who had never set foot in a fire hall or, or were not on the front lines of first response. And for them, I had to write in such a way that the material was accessible. And so I would try to explain things uh, as I went along. And there's a section in here that I'm going to read um, in which I explain what the term call means to anyone who's ever been on call. And although in this context it's a fire and EMS context, I read it tonight for everybody here who took call for all the rest of us in the past year. Call, we call it. You take call, you're on call, you have a call. Are you on call today, people ask? In my hometown, we are on call 24 hours a day. We're not scheduled. We're simply assumed to be available. We carry our pagers everywhere we go. We sleep with them beside the bed. You get so you jump at anything that beeps or jingles. I stayed with a friend over the holidays, and she had this Christmas clock with a little Dickens scene, and every hour on the hour, it played a wheezy electronic carol, the first note of which matched exactly the tone of the fire page. Every hour on the hour, that clock would fire up and I'd jerk like I'd been goosed. I was paged 106 times last year. Fires, drunks, babies, grandmothers, injured farmers, frightened salesmen, old fishermen. The pager is on my hip right now, even as I type. It will go off perhaps in the next five minutes, perhaps next Tuesday when I'm in the bathroom. My heart will jump. If I'm getting something from under the sink, I may crack my head on the grease trap. I'll listen for the details, find out where, begin forming a half-baked picture in my head. I'll run across the backyard headed for the hall. Whoever's out there needing help, they're getting me, for better or worse. Me and a handful of my neighbors. We'll do what we can. There was this old man, we used to get called to his apartment almost on a weekly basis. He had a heartbeat like a broke down roller coaster. And every once in a while he'd just check out and his wife would dial 911. He was usually mildly dazed but smiling and conscious by the time we got there. We answered call after call. Then his wife died and he was left alone and we answered more calls until finally his old heart cashed in. But I remember walking in his bedroom at 2 a.m. toward the end there and seeing this little man looking up at us with such trust. And I thought one day, 
I'll be the little old man on the bed. And I hope my neighbors come when I call. So tonight, everything that follows, thank you so much to all of you out there who remained on call throughout the last year. And now the Blue Canvas Orchestra. so exciting for us. I, I played my first gig after not playing for, you know, the whole time. I was playing at home, no, but, and I, I was getting out the axe, my instrument, and it just wasn't working, and I, wow, maybe I lost it. I don't know where I lost it. Honey, have you found it? No. So I, I, uh, and what I was missing was you. As soon as I got in front of people again, it was like, yeah, that was it. I know people love music in the living room, but I'm a bigger fan of when we can do this. So thank you so much for being here. And thanks to all the Tiny Tent Show viewers. Uh, that kept us going. Ed, Ed, you know how sometimes when this has to happen and you don't have to do it, you tell that cannibal joke? <laughs> I, you know how you do that? Yeah. Well, I know. well, I got a cannibal joke. Oh, good, good. Uh -oh. Oh, no. All right. Two cannibals went to a wedding. They toasted the bride and groom. Oh! <laughs> how about a group groan for that one? Oh. <laughs> oh, here's a little uh, instrumental arrangement of a. Classic Motown tune, I'll bet you recommend. <laughs>
that it's been. Okay, we're going to continue on um, with a, uh, a tune that features Tom Mitchell. And if you don't know Tom, he's uh, been... Well, well, the first show you did, was that in 84? Uh, yes. With the Big Top? Dance yeah. the, before the Big Top. Okay. There wasn't a Big Top. No. Wow. Oh, yeah, yeah, the early days. Didn't yeah. you guys build the stage? We long? did. We built the stage stage with the uh, saw, hand saws and hammers and such. Wow. Musicians with hand saws and other horrible ideas. Well, maybe there wasn't then. I can't remember. And there was, gra this, there was grass right here. Oh, yeah. wow. There was no, uh, there, gra there was a stage was on, uh, the screen was on the ground. Wow. And this grass was still growing. Yes, stone tablets and, uh, and uh, I can't come up with a good joke for that one. <laughs> but this song, you know about this song, this is from Riding the Wind. It's the flood song to talk about the great flood of 1942. So if it's not raining now, it's going to be raining after this song. Everybody in town was saying good night, sleep tight. When it began to rain, it began to rain and to rain and to rain and to rain. rain. Everybody in town heard thunder roll. Even the dead would not be left alone that day. It began to rain and to rain and to rain and to rain. This was no pleasant summer shower. It rained 8.52 inches in 12 hours. No one was thinking flood, there was no warning of what would come to light in the morning. Well, the storm sewer snagged and the water let loose and the flood dragged sand and silt and rock through the heart of town. It began to rain, to rain, to rain. rain. Two rivers met at the old mill yard. Boat slips eight feet deep were filled. The boats lay high and dry. It began to rain. A five-foot boulder rolled through the big race. Not a fountain pen was left in the drugstore. There was four feet of sand on the main floor of the canopy. Johnson's food shop was noble. The Bjornquist building burns. No road, no telegraph, no telephone, no travel out, no nothing except by the lake to Ashland. It began to rain, rain, it rained. At the depot, Omaha cars were flipped. Rails ripped up, the section house carried away. It takes 
disaster An emergency To show that we are all just one big family Better pray for sunny weather Put this town back together From the top of Wisconsin, you are listening to Tent Show Radio. Welcome to Intermission, folks. The week we recorded the show you're hearing tonight, I told folks I hoped to make it up to Bayfield in my tour van to tell some stories in a tent, specifically the Lake Superior Big Top Chautauqua. Perched, as I like to say, high atop a hill overlooking Lake Superior and the Apostle Islands, a collection of jade dollops in the freshwater blue. Even now, the folks who run the tent are finding their way back into things, as are we all. I've referred to the past year as a time of great clarification. Take that as you will. I'm above all just happy to be once again packing up the van and hitting the road. I've been known to yammer on about how I am a loner and a lover of solitude, and by and large it is so, but sometimes when I'm surrounded by good and gregarious folk, I just can't help but enjoy myself. We've all done our best with what they call connectivity, but happy laughter and freewheeling chatter lose something in electronic translation. Some sounds you need to feel. I did so little road time last year, I never took the snow tires off the tour van. I like to say tour van as it implies a certain professional flash. Never mind that it's a 2002 Toyota with a duct tape license plate, two hubcaps, and four out of five working doors. Regarding that fifth door, it's all about economics related to the cost of repair in order to move from 80% access to 100% access. I use a variation on the same formula to calculate snow tire wear versus remounting costs. In this case, I'll be dropping the van off with our guy so he can switch out the tires but leave that stuck door be. He understands or he wouldn't be working on vans like mine. Last year, I was motoring sedately through one of the most dangerous traffic spots known to man, a high school parking lot, just as the kids were turned loose, when a young scholar backed smack into my van, and despite the resounding crunch, I didn't even flinch. Among the joys of driving junk is blithe equanimity regarding fender benders. 
We recently picked up another used van as the price was right, and considering the current market for previously loved vehicles and the state and cumulative mileage of the tour van and another pending teenage driver, it is good to hold some economical transport in reserve. The tailgate on this new van opens and closes by itself, which has led me to doing a lot of dodging and ducking. Also, it was very well cared for by the previous owner, and it turns out we need only change the oil as opposed to feed it oil. I did not intend this monologue to be an automotive report, but here we are. I hope you've been allowed some fresh air and sunlight of late and the good company of good humans. I hope in time you will feel free to gather up with like-minded souls to sing and be silly, just as we were allowed to do this night up north in the Big Top, where once again the Blue Canvas Orchestra and singers are taking the stage. Meanwhile, I'll get that guinea pig story ready. Busca el 
latido de tu corazón Párate y siente cada hueso Thank you. Yeah, Yasmin. We're going to ask Michael to come out here and tell us another story. Tell us a story, Michael. <laughs> it's so great to be back in the tent, like I said, under the pearl gray and blue canvas. I want to thank everybody for tuning into the Tiny Tent Shows. Um, that was great, and that sustained us. And But it was also weird, because I was sitting in my little room over the garage there, just talking at my computer. And uh, it made for this, in some ways it was very intimate, in other ways it's completely, oddly separate. I was getting ready to come in here tonight for the show and this guy walked up and he said, hey, Mike Perry, that's so good to meet you. And I'm like, well, yeah, I know. Uh, and I was doing that thing like, oh yeah, hey, good to see you too and everything. And, and I realized it's Abe, it's the guy that we did. I did all of the, he, he's the guy that put the tent shows together, but we'd never met. Um, and I do think that that's reflective of this organization in general. There are just so many people, whether it's the people who you already heard in the blue vests or donors, supporters, uh, just people who show up and help out and support. And so just a huge thank you right now to everybody who keeps this tent going. Um, I, I also wondered, you know, sitting, staring at my computer there, uh, just talking, and then these shows would come out and... Some days I had a hat on, some days I didn't. Some days I thought people were like, does he not have any other shirts? <laughs> um, but I'm just happy to be here. I, I started coming, when I started first started coming up to this tent, I was single and, and I had hair. Uh, a lot of hair. And now uh, I've been married for quite a, quite a while. I don't have my wedding ring on. There's nothing salacious to report. I was... <laughs> making some firewood and I took it off and I hung it up on the little pin there on the bulletin board by the phone and I just forgot to put it back on. But I was talking to someone earlier tonight and I've been wearing it long enough that I can't go to the bar and fake it because I got that indentation going there. So there will be none of that. Uh, tan line, yeah, I got the little white white ring. But uh, I started coming up here, I was, a, I was a bachelor. I didn't get married till I was 39 years old. Um, and, but then one day I went to the library and I met a woman. And I've told the American Library Association they're free to use that quote in all their promotional materials. <laughs> so far, nothing. I think they're really kind of missing the boat on that. Um, and when I got married, uh, my wife was a single mom and she had a, a little three-year-old girl uh, that I now refer to as my given daughter. And... Um, you know, that little girl, so unexpected in my life, but so sweet, um, so dear. Um, there was just one thing that always bothered me about her. <laughs> and that was that pretty early on into me being in her life, I realized she was what my dad and brothers and I, growing up on the dairy farm, referred to as horse people. <laughs> capital H, capital P. I don't know if any of you know any horse people. Perhaps there are some here this evening. Uh, you know, they seem nice enough. <laughs> my dad loves them because my dad sells organic horse hay. <laughs> Say what you will about horse people, but they will pay top dollar for a hay bale. Uh, they're going to want to sniff it, smoke it, and make tea with it first, but... Once they decide it's good enough for their horsey, they'll haul out the checkbook. 
And uh, so my dad, he, he thinks they're great because they buy us all his organic horse. But anyway, this poor little girl, so sweet, such a good little kid. We were living in, in the village at the time in a little house on Main Street, but we were getting ready to move out to the farm that we live on now. And she would always ask me if she could have a horse. And so finally one day I just said, I'll tell you what, when we move to the country, you can have a guinea pig. You know, I was thinking we'll start out small and see how that goes and then maybe move up to the larger quadruped. The problem was I, I don't know much about horses, but I know even less about guinea pigs. So, but the good news was that my sister-in-law, Barbara, is part of a nationwide network of volunteers who conduct hamster and guinea pig rescue. <laughs> I wish you wouldn't snicker. Okay, these are good people doing important work. <laughs> so I called my sister-in-law, Barbara, and I said, we need a guinea pig. She said, don't give it another thought, I'll take care of everything. And so she sends out her emergency guinea pig beacon, or whatever it is they do. She locates a guinea pig, homeless and in distress, in Indianapolis. And so my sister-in-law gets in her car in rural New Auburn, Wisconsin. Her compatriot co-conspirator gets in her car with the guinea pig in Indianapolis. They drive across the country, meet at the halfway point at some undisclosed location, and conduct the underground guinea pig railroad handoff. <laughs> and we wind up with a guinea pig. Now, my brother and my bro and sister-in-law, they don't have any children, so this was their chance to be doting aunt and uncle. Not only did they give us a guinea pig, but they gave us a giant guinea pig cage, a purple plastic igloo for the guinea pig to hang out in, uh, a guinea pig exercise ball, which the guinea pig ignored, um, guinea pig food trays, guinea pig treats, uh, guinea pig vitamin C drops. Didn't know about those, but it's a thing. And then they also gave us a bag of guinea pig hay. And this guinea pig hay, man, it is top grade stuff, all right? You're looking at a guy who's put up thousands of hay bales in his life. Take my word for it. This is absolutely prime, top dollar. And the guinea pig loves it. He loves it so much. You just so much as rattle that bag and he whistles. So I tell my daughter, here's the deal. We are going to do everything exactly as Aunt Barbara instructed us because Daddy's not going to be the one to call Aunt Barbara and tell her we offed the guinea pig. <laughs> so for the first few weeks, things go fine. Everything seems to be working great. And then one day, my daughter comes up to me and she says, the guinea pig is out of hay. I said, no problem, I'm going to town. I'll go to the pet store. I'll get the guinea pig some more hay. So I go to town, I go to the pet store, I locate the guinea pig section, I locate the guinea pig hay section, and then I don't just grab the first bag I see. I make sure I'm not, not gonna waver from the Aunt Barbara program. I make sure that it is the same brand, the same size, same bag, same everything. And I take it up to the checkout, and when that woman swiped that bag across the scanner, and the price popped up, I suddenly discovered what it was that was making that guinea pig whistle. Because <laughs> I made a very similar noise, although mine was more of a wheeze. So the first thing I do is I just take the, I go right straight out to the van in the parking lot. I don't even start the van. I just, I just get my phone out and I open the little calculator app and I did the math. And at that time in Chippewa County, Wisconsin, top grade organic horse hay was selling for 175 bucks a ton. That guinea pig hay calculated out to 18,650 bucks a ton. So the next thing I did, immediately, still haven't started the van, I just called my dad. And I said, Dad, these horse hay people are pikers, man. I was like, <laughs> guinea pig hay is where it's at. <laughs> like, sell everything and get yourself a miniature baler. <laughs> so
So we've been a self-employed family for years, and, you know, things are okay, but we've had to be frugal. And we try to convey the concept of frugality to our children. And so I realize that what we have here is what the experts refer to as a teachable moment. <laughs> I will instruct my child. So all the way home, I'm practicing my frugality sermon. And I walk into the door of our house, and my daughter's... She's at the table doing homework. And I walked in, and I held up that bag. I said, you see this bag of guinea pig hay? Yes. It's the last one. <laughs> Why? You know how much a ton of good horse hay costs? No. 175 bucks a ton. You know how much this guinea pig hay costs? No, 18650 bucks a ton. At which point, she looked me straight in the eye, waited about three quarters of a second, and said, well then, we better get a horse. <laughs> Let's have some more from the BCO. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Well, we're going to do one more tune for you tonight and send you on your way. This is Severin, and he's feeling all right. So, so he's going to do a tune called... Feeling all right. Feeling all right. <laughs> funny how that works. Seems I got to have a change of scene Cause every night I have the strangest dreams Imprisoned by the way it might have been Left here on my own or so it seems I got to leave it before I start to scream
the same But at the time you knew I really felt that way But what was then and now is today Canvas Orchestra, folks, under canvas where they and you belong. Funding support for Tent Show Radio is provided by the Bayfield Inn. With 21 hotel rooms, over 25 vacation rentals, a lounge, on-site restaurant, and rooftop bar, there's something for you at the Bayfield Inn. More info at bayfieldinn.com. And by the Bayfield Chamber of Commerce, beautiful Bayfield and the Apostle Islands. You can tour sea caves and shop our galleries and stores on the shores of Lake Superior. Info and lodging at bayfield.org. And by the Cable Chamber of Commerce, Cable, Wisconsin, the gateway to Bayfield County, where world-class trails, forests, lakes, and adventure await. Visit cableforfun.com. That's cable, the number four, F-U-N dot com. Ten Show Radio is produced by Matt Eugenheimer, Michael Perry, and yours truly, Philip Anich. And brought to you in partnership with PRX, Public Radio Exchange. Give a man a fish, he will eat for a day. Teach a man to fish and you will find bait in your refrigerator. Well, folks, that's our show for tonight. Whether you beam it or stream it, we thank you for listening. We're as grateful as a guy who gets to gather up now and again. We'd love it if you come on up Bayfield Way or down or over or through for a live show one day. Details always available at bigtop.org. You can always visit me anytime at sneezingcow.com. Until next we share the air, remember where I come from and here at Tent Show Radio, nobody ever says goodbye. They just say, well, I suppose.